A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. Yoruba Land in the 19th Century, The Wars of Change. In the history of the Yoruba people, the 19th century was a century of tumultuous happenings, of the coming and growth of powerful new influences, and of profound, transformational, changes. Starting from the Oyo part of Yoruba land and the other Yoruba kingdoms that had been parts of the Oyo Empire, wars swept through the whole of Yoruba land and, as they did, they set afoot a whole array of demographic, economic, social and political developments and changes. From about the second decade of the century, Islam, which had existed in traces in Yoruba land, spread faster and wider than before. From about the middle of the century, Christian missions penetrated Yoruba land and quickly spread all over. Christianity brought with it Western education, and thus inaugurated the emergence of a literate, Western-educated, elite. At the same time, the legal abolition, and gradual demise, of the Atlantic slave trade, opened up a new era in which the productive economy of Yoruba land was gradually drawn into the economy of Europe and the wider world. Also at the same time, European political influence grew, culminating, at the end of the century, with the imposition of European imperial rule over all Yoruba people. The present chapter will deal only with the wars and their consequences. The next chapter will focus on the other influences, developments and changes. This approach is adopted only for the sake of simplicity, since the wars and all the other developments were intricately interwoven in their courses and effects. Causes of the Wars In the last chapter, we gave an account of the disintegration and collapse of the Oyo Empire and of the Oyo Kingdom that had constituted the core of the empire. The wars generated by that process of disintegration were not merely the first wars in 19th century Yoruba history, they proved to be the precursors of wider storms of war that came to rage all over Yoruba land for the rest of the century. The disintegration of the Oyo Empire and Kingdom destroyed the pre-existing system of order and security in Yoruba land and created a situation whereby all centers of power, old and new, had to scramble to establish new systems and patterns that would guarantee order and security. Those efforts created conflicts and wars which the Yoruba people were not able to put an end to until European powers intervened and imposed their own system of order, security and peace. For two full centuries prior to the 19th century, the Oyo Empire had exercised powerful influences for peace in Yoruba land both indirectly and directly. Indirectly, the Oyo Kingdom, plus the Yoruba provinces in the Ilafans Empire, amounted to a very substantial part of Yoruba land about half of its land area and probably more than half of its total population. For two centuries, this large area under the Alafans rule enjoyed orderly government, peace, prosperity and pride. The Alafans Yoruba domains were like a wide umbrella of peace and order, shielding and transmitting peace to the rest of Yoruba land. In short, in an indirect, intangible, but very real way, the Alafans domains laid down the standard of order and peace and thus encouraged and guaranteed order and peace in the rest of Yoruba land. Directly, widespread Yoruba traditions attest to the Alafans' interventions in disputes within and between Yoruba kingdoms beyond his own domain's interventions that usually succeeded in maintaining or restoring peace. The Alafans' name and aura were great, and he employed them directly to uphold order and peace in the Yoruba homeland. When, therefore, in the course of the first decades of the 19th century, the Oyo Empire disintegrated, as also its base, the Oyo homeland, and the once proud state of the Alafans fell into dissolution, a major pillar of peace in Yoruba land crumbled. It is not difficult to imagine the sort of effects that the disruptions and violence in the Oyo homeland would have produced in the rest of Yoruba land reports of terrible conflicts among princes of the Oyo country, of blasted towns and villages, of massive flights of people from their homes and their towns, of Alafan after Alafan isolated and helpless in his palace while Oyo princes destroyed their country of an obscure resident foreigner in Alorin taking advantage of the mess created by Oyo leaders to become a terror to the whole land, of countless towns shattered before the Alorin cavalry and of endless crowds of destitute refugees in desperate flight for dear life. But much worse was soon to follow, as the reports ceased to be merely reports. By the middle of the second decade of the century, the refugees from the Oyo country began to arrive in the rest of Yoruba land, especially in the Yoruba middle belt frightened, many of them detached from family and loved ones, destitute having lost all the substance of their earthly labor, often made violent by desperation, in their thousands and tens of thousands. The well-to-do or highly placed Oyo citizen might be able to flee in some order, but that was beyond the overwhelming majority of poor and vulnerable folks. Their numbers increased exponentially in the two decades that followed, and probably did not begin to decrease until the last years of the 1830s. For the people of the towns and villages to which they came, these must have been very traumatic times. At least in one area of the Yoruba Midlands, in the Igba and Ou countries, 
their coming turned out to be much worse than traumatic, it became unbelievably destructive. Many towns and villages in those parts suddenly found themselves under vicious attacks by crowds of people too desperate to talk accommodation or hospitality. The story of a man named Dato, though by no means typical of most, is illustrative of what these terrible times could do to a person. Dato was a man of some reputation and of strong military credentials from the Oyo homeland. He did his last military service as a member of a company of valiant men who, determined never to stop resisting Iloran, kept fighting in engagement after engagement until their number dwindled close to zero. Kurunmi, later ruler of IJ, belonged to this company. The survivors retreated to the small town of Ikota near IJ. Having lost wives, children and all earthly belongings, they had become so brutalized and calloused by their experiences that most of them were in no mood to wait on the goodwill and hospitality of the Ikotan people, but turned their military power on their hosts. So they violently seized homes, belongings, farms and wives and turned their hosts who would not run away into menial servants. When they had eaten up everything available in Ikotan and its farms, they extended their forays into IJ farms. IJ farmers rose up and attacked these marauders, and a skirmish ensued. Kurunmi urged a gentler, conciliatory, approach, but Dato denounced him and the rest and led a small group to attack IJ. The people of IJ were driven from their farms into their town, and then the whole population, unready for war, fled the town apparently believing that they would be able to return after their desperate guests had gone away. The company then moved from Ikoden and took possession of IJ, and decided to make IJ their permanent home, with Dato as their leader and ruler. As ruler, Dato turned out to be a disaster. He had no interest in farming or other civil pursuits. All his thoughts and utterances were about fighting wars. Those of his colleagues who settled down and raised farms he accused routinely of cowardice. At last, his colleagues could no longer stand him, and they drove him and his few adherents from the town, and chose Kurunmi as their ruler. Dato wandered from there with his group until he came to a little town called Tobolagbo. Frightened by his military reputation, the ruler and chiefs of Tobolagbo came out to meet him and offer their hospitality. But, as they stood before him, he ordered his men to fall on them and kill all of them. He then entered the town and thoroughly looted it. With the booty from there, he went on to Aberur and near Iberekado, and built a large compound where he resided for some time with his new wives, his children and his followers. But he was not able to settle down. The Igba had meanwhile founded a Bayokuda and some Oyo refugees and others had established a new large town at the destroyed Igba village of Ibadan, and Ibadan and a Bayokuda were engaged in some conflicts. Dato left Aberurin with his family and joined Ibadan in a campaign in which Ibadan was fighting at Anyaifun against a Biokuta. When the Ibadan forces were defeated there, Dato narrowly escaped with his life, but he lost his whole family and all his belongings. From then on, lonely and destitute, he wandered from place to place, including even a visit to some relatives in the city of Aloran, and a short residence at Ibadan as a guest of an Ibadan chief. Finally he wandered back to IJ, where Kurunmi had him arrested and executed. No other prominent refugee from the Oyo country is known to have become as dissolute as Dato, but the experiences of Ikoatan, IJ and Tobolagbo were not very dissimilar from the experiences of many other towns and villages in the Igba country at the hands of some of the most desperate refugee groups. Things were extremely hard for the refugees and, for many of them, the temptation to lapse into brigandage was strong. Many small towns and villages in this part of the country were not just violently seized but totally destroyed. In short, then, the coming of large streams of refugees from the Oyo homeland southwards to other parts of the Yoruba national homeland was, for an initial, fairly long period, productive of much violence and destruction, and very serious deterioration of security, especially in the west-central area of the Yoruba Middle Belt. In the years that followed, new significant centers of population crystallized in this Middle Belt area and went through a process of consolidation, a process that occasioned much stress as well as conflicts and wars. Thereafter, the maturing new states went through a period of rivalry amongst themselves, featuring, again, conflicts and wars. From these, one new state emerged the most successful and strongest of all. Back in the shattered homeland of Oyo in the north, one old city under a new, and foreign, leadership and carrying the banner of a new religion, had emerged as the sole powerful successor of the destroyed kingdom of the Alafans. From its base in the north, this new kingdom, Eloran, intent on imposing its own version of order on all of Yoruba land, continued to pursue the refugees southwards, bringing relentless pressure to bear on the new states emerging in the Middle Belt. From among the latter, the most successful, Ibadan, stood up to resist the pressure from the north. It succeeded wonderfully, and, because of that success, it developed bigger ambitions, 
namely, to prevent the Northern Kingdom from establishing a foothold anywhere in the vulnerable areas of northeastern and eastern Eurobaland. That ambition, because it met with success after success, became transformed into yet a bigger ambition to establish control over all, or almost all, of Eurobaland, to build a new empire of the Yoruba people. The empire building venture too, though it encountered varying degrees of local resistance almost everywhere, proved successful, so much so that it looked as if Yorubaland was at last about to find a viable new order. But a major surge of resistance, widespread and considerably unified, then rose to confront the nascent order in a long, final, series of stubborn wars. While these major wars were in progress throughout the century, many types of local disputes and hostile relationships were being played out in local wars. Also, while Yoruba land in general was thus preoccupied in wars, foreign neighbors, first the Nup and then the Dahomey, took advantage and repeatedly invaded Yoruba land. The Oyo War The first war outside the Oyo homeland, then, was the Oyo War, circa 181,222. The Oyo War was, indirectly and directly, caused by the troubles of the Oyo country. The remotest root of it was planted when the Alafin Awol ordered the Oyo army in circa 1793 to attack and sack the Ife market town of Apamu. As would be remembered, the Bale of Apamu, finding that the Uni of Ife was not able to save Apamu, gave his own life in order to save his town. Hatred for Oyo authorities, resulting from this, never died at Apamu and other Ife villages near Apamu. Years later, as the power of the Alafin's government disintegrated, Oyo traders trading at Apamu or passing through to the Ijebu country came under occasional attacks by the people of Apamu and the other Ife villages. By then, the Alafin was no longer able to help his subjects. However, two of the leading chieftains of the Oyo country, Adagun, the Anakoyi of Ikoi, and Toj, the Bale of Ogbomoso, sent messages to the Olau of Ou, Akinjobi, urging him to help stop the attacks on Oyo traders. Thereupon, an Ou army went into action and suppressed Apamu and some other Ife villages. This led to a brief war between Ife and Ou, circa 1812, in which the Ife army was defeated. Ife then embarked on bigger preparations for war and asked the Awu Jali of Ijebu Ode for help. The rulers of Ijebu Ode under the Awu Jali had long resented what they regarded as Oas over ambition over the trade routes that connected the Ijebu country with most of the Yoruba interior. Now, they bristled at Oas' sacrilegious disrespect of Ife. An Ife Ijebu alliance was formed, and it declared war on Ou in 1817. At the bottom of all these developments around Apamu were the centuries old rivalries for the control of the large trade in the market town of Apamu and the routes through the Apamu area. At the height of the power of the Oyo Empire, the Oyo traders had come to dominate this trade with the strong support of the Ou people, who benefited enormously from being supporters of the Alafin's government and friends of Oyo traders. As would be remembered, this had considerably marginalized Ife even though Apamu was an Ife town, and generated hostility between Ife and Owu. The growing disorder in the area threatened Ijeba's trade, and Ijebu was poised to intervene there especially to stop what was widely perceived as Owu's excessive aggressiveness and its disrespect of Ife's interests. The usually formidable Owu army marched out to meet the Ife Ijebu allies, but the allies proved to be stronger especially because the Ijebu army was armed with guns bought from European traders on the coast. The Owu army fell back on their city which was then besieged by the Allies. The Oyo chiefs who had got Ou into this situation could not help the Ola'u, they were too preoccupied with the troubles in their own country. As the siege dragged on, large numbers of Oyoman refugees fleeing from their own country joined with the Allies outside the walls of Ou Ipol. The invaders thus became too strong for the defenders, and Ou Ipol's defenses collapsed in circa 1822. The Ola'u, by then a warlike king named Amur Oro, managed to escape. The invading armies, greatly swollen by the Oyo refugees, then broke into the city and completely wiped it out. According to widespread traditions, the Uni ordered that a curse be placed on the side of Ou Ipol, with an interdict that it would never again be resettled. Ou Ipol survivors fled, and so did the inhabitants of all the smaller Ou towns some southwards into northern Ijebu, but most into neighboring Igba villages. The victorious allies, greatly swollen in numbers by the continually arriving Oyo refugees, followed them into the Igba country because some of the Igba villages had helped the Ou during the siege of Ou Ipol. One by one, all towns and villages in the eastern and central parts of the Igba country were destroyed. The Igba people, plus most of the Ou, then fled westwards. When they came under the Aliyamal rock in the far western part of the Igba country, they settled down and began to build a new town which they named Abeokuta. Thus ended the Ou war. It needs to be added that the siege of Ou, 
circa 181,722, was contemporary with Afanja's creation of his Jama'a army in Aloran in 1817, and his conquest of parts of the Oyo country. Oo was destroyed in 1822 and Afanja died in 1824. As will be remembered, Afanja's death was followed by unsuccessful attempts by Oyo armies to dislodge the Fulani from Aloran, and by the firm establishment of an Islamic emirate in Aloran. The Wars of Newly Consolidated States While the disintegration of the Old Order proceeded in the Oyo homeland in the north, important consolidation of new centers of population began in the late 1820s in the Yoruba Midlands to the south. In the west of the region, Abiyo Kuta, founded in 1830, quickly became one of the largest aggregations of population in Yoruba land. Its political evolution was guided by the fact that it had received substantial populations of the three arms of the Igba people as well as survivors of the Ou kingdoms. Abiyo Kuta therefore became a state comprising many kingdoms namely the Ou and the paramountcy of the Olau, and the kingdoms of the Igba Lig, the Igba Gur and the Igba Okona. A steady stream of Oyo refugees had continued to swell the populations of northern Ijesa towns, Ife towns and villages, and the mostly depopulated Ou and Igba countries. Three major settlements sprang up in the latter area. In the small village of Agooya, a group settled under the leadership of an Oyo Ila prince named Atiba, a son of the Alafin Abyotun. Agooya was the birthplace of Atiba's mother. Agooha's name became changed simply to Oyo. In the deserted Igba town of Ij, another group settled as would be remembered, ultimately under the leadership of a warrior named Kurunmi. After most of the commanders of the allied Ife, Ijebu and Oyo troops that had destroyed the Ou and Igba towns and villages had returned home, a large group of the troops camped at a deserted Igba village named Ibadan, which quickly developed into a regular town. From this point on, most of the accounts of the 19th century wars center around the history of these refugee settlements of Aokuda, Ibadan, Ij and Oyo in the Islamic kingdom of Aloran in the north which became one of the most powerful states of the Yoruba people. At Ibadan, the first person acknowledged as ruler was an Ife warrior chief, Okanad, the May of Ife. Highly respected and feared for his military reputation, Okanad set out to impose strong discipline on the crowd of refugees who constituted most of Ibadan's new population. He was particularly hard on the poor and destitute among the refugees, because he regarded them as unruly. His efforts led to a revolt and the revolt quickly developed into a civil conflict in which the May, supported by his Ife soldiers, many Oyo refugees, and many Igba and Ou who had returned to live in Ibadan, was confronted by the majority of the refugees. The May's supporters outnumbered his opponents, who trembled at the very mention of his name, but it was the fear and desperation of his opponents that won the conflict. When he finally fell into their hands, they could not believe what had happened, and they did not know what to do with him until one of them took courage and struck him dead. After that, the town was gripped for many days with the fear that he would somehow return. Ibadan gradually settled down after this confusion, and established the rudiments of government. As it took shape, Ibadan's system of government was strange to Yoruba culture and traditions. For all Yoruba people, government had always meant monarchy. Ibadan evolved a republican system of government featuring two parallel lines of chiefs a civil line and a military line. The civil line was topped by the bail and the military line by a chief bearing a military title like Basarun or Are. As the Ibadan system was ultimately established, rising up the ladder in each line of chiefs was by promotion. Any person, no matter his ancestry, could be appointed a junior chief, and then rise up the ladder in his line. The qualification was merit a combination of good character and contribution to the progress of the city. Therefore, with good character and continued good civic record, and luck, the junior chief could rise to the top. As the Ibadan system thus de-emphasized traditional Yoruba lineages and lineage claims, a new type of family group and new type of Agbo Ila developed in Ibadan. Each such group coalesced around a prominent person and built a compound for itself. The binding force in this new type of Agbo Ila or compound was not belief in a common ancestry but attachment to one leader. If the leader happened to become significantly successful in the Ibadan political system, more of the people arriving in Ibadan would gravitate towards him and join his compound. As a result, the Agbo Ila of some of the highest chiefs tended to be large, sprawling, compounds. A very successful trader could build up a large compound also. Later in the century, one of the largest compounds in Ibadan was owned by a rich woman trader named Afunzi Itanani Wura, by then the Yalod, highest woman chief, of Ibadan. Over time, Ibadan became a very attractive place to ambitious people from all over Yoruba land. Yoruba people who were strongly attached to their tradition and culture, like kings and traditional chiefs, 
tended to deride Ibadan as a people without a king. But the ambitious young person who wanted to succeed in commerce, in some trade, or politically, could not resist the lure of this wonderful new city where one could become a big person regardless of one's lowly parentage or one's place of origin. As a result, people poured into Ibadan from all corners of Yoruba land. And as Ibadan grew bigger, so did the opportunities it offered. Ibadan was well located to trade in all directions, southwards to Lagos through Ijebu or Bayokuda routes, southwestwards through Igbado to Porto Novo, eastwards through Ife, Ijesa, Akiti, Akoko, Owo, to Benin, northwards to the Niger through an endless number of routes. The large and growing population provided a growing customer base for local traders and for artisans of all types. And when Ibadan began to succeed in war and empire building, it became the ideal home for young men who wanted to distinguish themselves in valor and in politics. And so they came from the homelands of all Yoruba subgroups even from as far as the land of the Okan Yoruba close to the niger benue confluence. As they came also, they brought their various versions of the Yoruba cultural heritage. Migration into successful towns had always been a trait in Yoruba history, with Ibadan, that trait produced its greatest pre-20th century fruit. At Ij, not far to the east of Ibadan, another large population of refugees accumulated. The settlement had a rough beginning, as would be remembered, under the leadership of Dato. After Dato was removed from the scene, his place was taken by Kurunmi. With Kurunmi as leader, IJ grew very rapidly as large groups of refugees came to it, attracted by Kurunmi's reputation. A man of considerable personal charisma and military brilliance, Kurunmi quickly built IJ into a well-ordered city with a formidable military machine. Like Ibadan, IJ evolved into a state without a king. It grew into a military dictatorship ruled by Kurunmi who was much loved, even adored, by his people. Much has survived in the traditions about the person of this man. He was one of the most resourceful generals of 19th century Yoruba history. He was fond of illuminating his speeches with colorful proverbs. He loved to sing and dance and, when excited, would couch his proverbs in songs and dance to them. He was also impulsive by nature, and as he grew old that trait seemed to worsen but he never ceased being a great military commander and leader of men. The new town of Oyo under Atiba's leadership also grew into a big city. Until 1835, Atiba continued, as a prince of the dying old Oyo kingdom, to take part in the affairs of the old kingdom while slowly building his new town. He was in the Olafin Aluiwa's campaign against Aloran in 1835, the campaign in which Aluiwu perished, resulting in the abandonment of Oyo Ila. After that terminal disaster of the old empire, Atiba was crowned Alafin in his new town. Many urged him to return to the abandoned Oyoil and rebuild it, but he chose to establish a new center for the Oyo kingdom. A man of enormous capabilities and great dreams, Atiba embarked on a very intelligent and expertly orchestrated effort to substitute his new Oyo for the dead Oyoila, and to make himself a direct inheritor of the power, greatness and glory of the Alafins of the imperial era. He was so successful at this that the leaders of Ibadan and Ij agreed to subscribe to his dreams and plans. According to such dreams, the old Oyo Empire would be revived or would be regarded as still in existence. Atiba would rule over it all as the Alafin. The new town of Oyo would be the new imperial capital. The rulers of Ibadan and Ij would be the Alafins Basarun and Kakonfo, respectively. Ibadan would defend the Ikonosi of the empire, that is, the Asin and Ibolo areas, and Ij would defend its Ikonotan that is, the upper Ogun region and the regions to the west. Ultimately, the revamped empire would drive the Fulani out of Aluran. The very important step was taken of conferring the titles of Basaran on Aluyo of Ibadan and Kakonfo on Kurunmi of Ij. At Oyo, the Alafin began to build a large, prestigious, palace befitting the dignity of the new imperial capital a beautiful, though smaller, replica of the great palace of Oyoila. Beyond those steps, however, the Alafin Atiba was not able to go. It soon became clear that Ibadan and Ij, not Atiba Zoyo, were the real centers of power, and that each had expansionist or imperial ambitions of its own. By 1840, then, many centers of large population had emerged across the breadth of the central region of Yoruba land. Many towns of the Asin Valley, Iwo, Ede, Ajigbo, Ikiran, northern Ijesa towns, Osogbo, Igbajo, Otan, Ada, as well as some Ife towns, Ikiri. Gabongan and the cluster of villages in the Irigbo suburb of Ila Ife, had swollen up rapidly, many of them expanding far beyond their old town limits. A large refugee town named Modak sprang up as a twin to the ancient city of Ila Ife. But the most important creations of this time of consolidation were the five new cities Ibadan, Ije, New Oyo, Abiyokuta, 
and Deloren. As Ibadan and Abeokuda to settled down, a jostling for territorial advantage immediately arose between them. Ibadan leaders were concerned that Abeokuda occupied a strategic location that could block their access to the trade routes through Igbado to the port of Ajis, Porto Novo. Ibadan therefore embarked on a series of campaigns to drive Abeokuda from its location, campaigns which resulted in Ibadan Abeokuda battles in villages between the two major towns. In these mini wars, the Ijebu Ode Kingdom usually supported Ibadan, because the Ijebu were also concerned about Abeokuda's competition with Ijebu traders in the coastal trade with Lagos and the rest of the Awari country. Whenever Ibadan went into conflict with Abeokuda, Ijebu sent help to Ibadan, and Ibadan reciprocated whenever Ijebu declared war on Abeokuda. On a few occasions too, Ibadan managed to secure the assistance of Ij under Kurunmi. Against all these, Abeokuda proved remarkably able to stand its ground recording a number of victories over the Allies over Ijebu in a battle that was fought on the Oiwi stream, and over Ibadan at the village of Banyai Fun. An Ibadan attempt to attack Abeokuda itself failed in a battle outside Abeokuda, which became known as the Jabara War. A major Igba campaign against Ijebu led to a long siege of the Ijebu town of Ipuru, but it too failed when a strong Ibadan force came to the aid of Ijebu. For most of the late 1820s and early 1830s, therefore, the relationship of the Ibadan Ijebu allies with Abeokuta featured a series of conflicts and inconsequential victories and defeats. Against the opposition of Ibadan and Ijebu then, Abeokuta settled down and began to prosper. In fact, during the same years, Abeokuta exerted military pressure on the neighboring Igbado towns and took control of Ilaro and Diana. To the south, Abeokuta attacked the old Awari kingdom of Ada. With the help of troops from the Lagos kingdom and from Ibadan, Ada held on for months against the Abeokuta invaders, but eventually fell. While Ibadan, supported by Ijebu and, sometimes, Ij, and Abeokuta thus preoccupied themselves with their local wars, the consolidation of all the new states, and the peace or even the existence of the old states of Midland and southern Yorubaland, was threatened by determined enemies from the west and north. From the west, the kingdom of Dahomey, freed from Oyo rule by about 1823, began immediately to put pressure on neighboring provinces of Yorubaland. Dahomey did not only desire control of the trade routes in the Igbado country, it also wanted to seize territory for agricultural purposes. Dahomey armies intensively harassed the Igbado towns, particularly Ayana, Ilaro, and Rifurfu, and ultimately destroyed Rifurfu. Abeo Kuta moved in force into Igbado, however, and stopped Dahomey by, as earlier pointed out, taking control of Ilaro and Diana. The situation was to remain this way until the 1850s when Dahomey finally made a frontal attack on Abeokuta, only to be firmly repulsed. From the north, the Oyo Emirate of Aloran was much stronger, more persistent, and more successful. Aloran had developed into a predominantly Islamic Yoruba kingdom, and most of its troops and commanders were of Yoruba, mostly Oyo, stock, with a strong complement of Hausa and Fulani commanders and troops essentially the army which Afonja had created for Aloran though with additions and modifications over time. Eloran forces pushed southwards until they came to the Asin Valley and even harassed towns and villages as far as the Ife Kingdom. About 1835, the populations of the Ife towns of Ikire, Gabongan and the Arigba villages were forced to flee into Iila Ife. In the last years of the 1830s, it looked as if nothing could stop the Eloran from pushing all the way to the coast to dip the Quran in the sea. The fate of the new towns Ibadan, Ij. Oyo and Abeokuda as well as of the old kingdoms south of them in the Awari and Ijebu countries seemed to hang in the balance. In 1840, however, the tide suddenly turned. Ibadan had started to confront the Aloran forces by 1838. At Osobo in 1840, the Ibadan army met formidable Aloran forces and routed them very decisively, destroying their dreaded cavalry, killing or capturing most of their horses, and capturing many of the Aloran commanders. Thereupon, Ibadan forces pushed northwards, dislodging Eloran forces and pushing them all the way beyond Afa, to only a short distance from Eloran itself. Ibadan decided not to make any attempt on the narrow territory between Afa and Eloran because it was too firmly controlled by the Eloran cavalry. The boundary of Eloran's domain came to stabilize at this line. Ibadan thus saved the consolidation of the new towns and cities in the middle belt of Yorubaland. People who had been forced by the Eloran threat to flee their towns in these places returned. The inhabitants of the Ife towns of Ikire, Gabongan and the Arigba villages returned home from Ila Ife. Ibadan's Territorial Expansion One of the most important consequences of the Ibadan victories over Aloran at Osogbo and beyond Osogbo was the emergence of an Ibadan Empire. 
For the towns of the Asin Valley and those north of their Duafa, acceptance of Ibadan's protection occurred as a matter of course. They had joined hands with the Ibadan forces in dislodging those of Aloran, and they needed Ibadan's protection against their return. As a result of the influence of a native son of Ikiri, Ahobo, who had become a prominent chief in Ibadan, Ikiri willingly accepted Ibadan's protection. Employing the well-tried system of provincial administration of the dissolved Oyo Empire, Ibadan placed Ayalis in all these towns and villages to watch over their security, to receive tributes for Ibadan, and to prod the local rulers to send troops and other types of help to Ibadan whenever such was needed. Ibadan's attention was soon attracted to other areas beyond the Asin Valley. After some lull in Iloran's military activities, its forces returned to the fight in about 1846. It was impossible for them to drive directly south as they had done before. Ibadan solidly barred the way in that direction. Therefore, they veered southeastwards into the Akiti, Igbamana and Ijesi countries. In the thickly forested parts of these generally hilly countries, Aloran forces, depending heavily on cavalry, fared badly. Making very good use of their hills and forests, the Akiti and Ijesa people drew the Aloran cavalry into an endless series of ambushes. As remnants of defeated cavalry troops tried to find their ways out of the forests, their pursuers, assisted by local farmers, chased them with shouts of pole. Pole. That is, fall or drop, the cry with which farmers chased farm thieves. From this, Iloran's abortive invasions of Akiti and Ijesa became known as the Pole War. In the northernmost parts of Akiti, as well as much of Igbamana, however, where the forests gave way to mostly tall grass, the Iloran invaders fared somewhat better. The Akiti kingdoms of Otun Moba and Obo came under intense pressure. The Iloran forces occupied the town of Ai in the Moba kingdom, a town which had been in revolt against the Ore of Otun, and from there tried to subdue Moba's capital town of Otun. In about 1847, the Ore, king of Moba, sent to Ibadan for help. Ibadan armies therefore headed for northern Akiti and the Igbamana country, against the Iloran forces. After dislodging them from northern Akiti and neighboring parts of Igbamana, the Ibadan armies fanned out into the rest of Akiti, Ijesa and, later, Akoko where new parades were going on. In most of Akiti and Ijesa, the Ibadan forces met with varying degrees of resistance. The city of Ilesa had one of the best defenses in Yoruba land and had to be besieged again and again. The Ahero of Ijero put up a strong defense for the town of Akoro in his kingdom and asked for help from other Akiti kingdoms. Some of them sent help, and the Ibadan army found itself confronted by a fairly large and dogged coalition which was subdued only after many long and fierce encounters. In northern Akiti, a fairly formidable power emerged in the person of Asug Baibi, founder of a new kingdom named Iade. Asug Baibi was born in the small town of Aya in far northern Akiti. As a young man, he won renown as an intrepid fighter against the Nupan and the Aloran invaders of his homeland. In about 1855, he migrated a little southwards to the woods between the kingdoms of Isan and Ataji in northern Akiti, bringing with him some followers, mostly warlike young men. His plans were to establish this new settlement as a strong base for his war against Aloran. More and more people came to join his new town, and this encouraged him to declare it a kingdom with himself as king, with the royal title of Atta. He soon proved to be as astute a politician as he was a tough warrior. Seeing Ibadan expelling Aloran forces from Akiti and taking control of most of Akiti, he decided to strengthen Iade with an alliance with Ibadan. In 1857, he went to Ibadan and offered to defend its interests against Aloran and the Nup in northeastern Akiti, and the rulers of Ibadan entered into an agreement with him appointing him as a sort of special vassal of Ibadan in northern Akiti. The English commercial traveller, Daniel May, visited Iade a day or two after Asug Baibi returned from Ibadan. Asug Baibi's real intention, however, was to protect his young kingdom and ensure its independence, and he had no desire to defend Ibadan's interests or to be subject to Ibadan. In the next two decades, Ayat as an independent kingdom, generally believed to be a close friend of Ibadan, attracted many more settlers and grew tremendously. From the information reaching Ibadan, Ayat looked more and more like a rival, rather than a vassal or agent, but Asug Baibi's diplomacy continued to prevent an Ibadan attack. In the Igbamana and Akoko countries, also, Ibadan encountered resistance, although the mostly small towns of Akoko did not have the strength to cause too much trouble for the Ibadan forces. The people of the Igbamana town of Oroago, located on a rocky hill, hid behind rocks on their hill and attacked the Ibadan troops with all sorts of missiles from there, until the latter gave up and left and went on to subdue Oro, Izi, Aludan and other Igbamana towns in that area. In spite of all these difficulties, Ibadan had, by about 1859, subdued most of the Akiti, Ijesa, Akoko and Igbamana kingdoms and stationed Ayalis in them. 
only a few kingdoms still remained independent, notably, besides Aid, Adu in Akiti, and Owo. Owo was reputed to be the most powerful kingdom in eastern Yoruba land. But its real strength against Ibadan resided in the fact that Owo controlled the road to the Benin market, which was vital for Ibadan's procurement of guns and gunpowder. Not only did Ibadan leave Owo free, Ibadan leaders actually made friends with Owo rulers. One Ibadan chief named Ayrind, who had fled from Ibadan to escape some punishment there, came to live in exile at Owo and, in order to appease his superiors at home, he organized large purchases of guns and gunpowder for Ibadan from Benin through Owo. As for Adu, the largest Hekiti kingdom, its warlike reputation seems to have discouraged attack by the Ibadan war chiefs operating in Ekiti. By 1850, the Ife kingdom too had become part of the Ibadan empire. As the new cities of Ibadan, Oyo, Abiyokuta, Ij and Aloran had grown to become the strongest states in Yoruba land from the 1820s to the 1840s, the Ife kingdom too had stirred itself. Under the influence of a radical youth movement advocating that Ife too should launch into an expansionist program, a movement of which the best known leader was a prince named Darren Shoyoran or Honor Darren for short, Ife had developed a fairly strong military which, apart from defending its borders against some little encroachments by Elisa, had turned its attention southwards to the Ondo kingdom in the deep southern forests. Earlier in the century, the people of Ondo had installed a very rich prince named Erolekolasi as their king, who, leaning heavily on his personal friends and large army of personally owned slaves, had proceeded to defy the traditional limitations on royal power, and institute a very unpopular despotism. This had provoked a revolt by the Ondo chiefs and prominent citizens, as a result of which Erolekolasi had been made to commit suicide in about 1845. In reaction to this, Erolekolasi's slaves, stationed at Okigbo, had started a rebellion. In late 1845, taking advantage of this disruption in Ondo, the Ife forces had occupied the Ondo border town of Okigbo and forced Oda Ondo itself to be evacuated. But, from the southern forests of their kingdom, the Ondo people had kept up a stiff counterattack that had gone on year after year. While this was happening in the southern forests, the Ife kingdom itself ran into serious trouble at home. In 1849, a violent conflict erupted between Ila Ife and its twin town of Modak, caused partly by attempts by some prominent Ife lineages to limit Modakik's access to farming land, and partly by unresolved questions about the status of Modak in the Yunus kingdom. Angry crowds of Modak people burst into Ila Ife, burning and destroying Ife houses. Ibadan intervened, calm tempers, and made it possible for the people of Ila Ife to rebuild their houses. Consequent upon this, both Modak and Ila Ife, and by implication, all of the Ife kingdom, became dependencies of Ibadan, and Ibadan Iyalis were stationed in them and in the other towns of the kingdom. By 1859, then, Ibadan's first wave of campaigns had expelled Aloran completely from the Akiti and Igbamana countries and created an empire comprising most of the kingdoms of Ibarapa, Asan, Ife, Ijesa, Igbamana, Ibolo, Akiti, and Akoko. To the southwest, the city of Abeokuta blocked any possible Ibadan expansion. The kingdoms of the Deep South in Owo, Ondo, Ijebu, Awari remained beyond Ibadan's control, and so too, did the towns and villages of the Yagba, O, Jamu, Bunu, Owuro and others near the Niger-Benue confluence. The upper Ogun region and the country to the west of it were regarded as territory under Ij's influence. The city of Aloran, with a narrow stretch of territory to the west and south of it, some of which territory was only reluctantly conceded by Ibadan, was consolidated as the new Aloran kingdom. From this time on, Aloran generally avoided direct confrontations with Ibadan's armies. The primary secret of Ibadan's victories in all its campaigns was that it was always able to put much larger numbers of men in the field than any opponent. And that ability stemmed ultimately from what we must call the Ibadan dream. When Ibadan decided to launch a campaign to a given destination, the practice was to appoint a senior chief to lead it. For the inner core of his army, the chief had the men of his compound his following. The chief would then seek other chiefs, of lower ranks, to join him with their followings. If the leading chief's reputation as a commander and leader was good, many lower-ranked chiefs would apply to him for a chance to serve under him. After leaving Ibadan, the army would have, in towns already under Ibadan's control, men waiting to join up. The latter would have been recruited and prepared by the Angel in each town, with the help of the local ruler. There was usually no difficulty in raising these provincial additions to the army. The Angel would put his energy into raising the men, because his reputation in Ibadan, and his future prospects, depended on it. The local ruler would cooperate with the Ajel except if the ruler wanted to start a revolt, and that was too risky. 
As for the men sought for recruitment, more usually came forward than were needed. Almost everywhere, young men wanted to be part of the Ibadan adventure and excitement that first infected the towns and villages of the Asin country and, slowly at first and then increasingly, grew in the Ife, Ahidi, Ijesa, Akoko and Igbamana towns and villages. Serving Ibadan held out a huge promise. If one attracted attention in the battles, one could end up in some position in Ibadan. Usually one would start as a junior chiefling in a chief's compound. Having thus become a notable man in a large compound, one had started the rise upwards in the Ibadan system with one's compound and chief rooting for one. A chief had vested interests in the growth of his young men, as they progressed in the system, so too did his own influence. Growth for the young man could lead to any of many types of elevation and appointment as a gel in the provinces, an official envoy, a chief in Ibadan itself, etc. There was some preference for men from the provinces in the appointment of Ayalis. How high one rose from there depended, as earlier pointed out, on one's character and performance plus, of course, the fortunes of one's compound. Once this picture of Ibadan became generally known, many men recruited into its armies in the provinces would not return home, but would go with some chiefs to Ibadan, there to start a career that could lead to unknown heights. And when an Ibadan army engaged in battle, its men fought with a fury that was fueled by this Ibadan dream. In other respects too, Ibadan's base for expansionist wars was very solid. Ibadan traders ensured an endless flow of arms and ammunition from the ports of Porto Novo, Lagos, and Benin. Many of them built substantial fortunes from this trade. To purchase arms and ammunition, Ibadan chiefs sold some of their war captives to traders who took them for sale to the dwindling number of ships still engaged in the Atlantic slave trade. Increasingly, products of the land were also sold to buy the arms and ammunition. Of these, the leading product was palm oil, of which Ibadan became a major source since it could procure supplies from all over the provinces of the empire. Some Ibadan chiefs themselves owned or sponsored large caravans carrying pots of oil, in addition to the almost endless flow of caravans owned by Ibadan traders. Food supply was also well provided for. At home in Ibadan, the people of the chief's compounds worked extensive farms. Most of the labor on such farms was supplied by enslaved war captives, but other members of the compounds also worked on the farms on a more or less regular basis. More will be said in the next chapter about trends in the development of farming in Ibadan and the rest of Yoruba land in the 19th century, suffice it to say here that the large population of Ibadan was very productive of farm crops, and that its large armies never had problems about food supply. Moreover, food supply for Ibadan armies was also heavily supplemented by food from the provinces. The Asan country served as the breadbasket for most of Ibadan's earliest campaigns in Akiti, Ijesa, and Igbamana. Later, these provinces added substantial contributions of food themselves. The IJ War By the late 1850s then, Ibadan had become the greatest single power in Yoruba land. However, that eminence was not undisputed. Kurunmi of IJ, for one, disputed it vehemently. As would be remembered, Kurunmi as ruler of IJ had started off being friendly with the rulers of Ibadan and giving them help on many occasions. On their part, they had also shown much deference to Kurunmi on account of his being older and more famous than they. That was in the early years, the 1820s and 1830s. As Ibadan flourished from about 1840 and went on to conquer an empire, the relationship between IJ and Ibadan deteriorated from just cool to very hostile. Various factors contributed to that. Not only did the Ibadan chiefs cease respecting Kurunmi, they increasingly put it to him that their own leader was his superior. They demanded that. Since the Basaran was senior to the Kakonfo in the traditional order, Kurunmi as Kakonfo should come to Ibadan to pay homage to the Basaran Aluyul. In 1854 a high-powered meeting of leaders of Ibadan, IJ, Abiyokuda and Ijebu was held at Ibadan to decide to put an end to all wars and cease selling Yoruba people as slaves. Those decisions were taken, but no positive result followed. For Kurunmi, the fact that the meeting was held at Ibadan and not at IJ, and that the Ibadan rulers were generally treated as more important than he, became causes of resentment and outrage. Behind all this growing hostility was the issue of territory. The Ilafin, Kurunmi and the Ibadan rulers had originally agreed to consign the Ikonosi to Ibadan and the Ikonotan to IJ, with the very clear understanding that the Ilafin would be king over both. Ibadan had gone on to expel Iloran from the Ikonosi and then gone far beyond to establish an empire for itself. Both Kurunmi and the Ilafin were alienated by this. But between Kurunmi and the Ilafin, territorial problems also developed, as Kurunmi set out to establish IJ's control over all of the Ikunotun, mostly the upper Ogun region, which, being close to Oyo, ought now, in the Ilafin's expectation, 
to be at least partly controlled by Oyo. As Kurunmi increasingly took control of the area and showed no readiness to concede much to the Alafin, intense hostility brewed between the two. The situation became really explosive when Ibadan, having become the overlord of the Ikonosi as well as of Ife, Ijesa, Ekiti, Igbamana, and Akoko, began to show interest in the upper Ogun area. Some towns in the area, notably the large town of Isain, attracted by Ibadan's greatness, began to gravitate towards it. From this cauldron of bad blood, hostile actions began to issue Ibadan against the Alafin and Kurunmi, and Kurunmi against Ibadan and the Alafin. When in one of such little acts of hostility on the farmlands a small Ibadan contingent was completely crushed by its IJ opponents, hostile feelings towards IJ became a raging fever in Ibadan. The Balagani Bikunle who spoke up for conciliation with Kurunmi in the Ibadan Council of Chiefs was accused by his colleagues of, of all things, cowardice, and was reprimanded and fined. The stage was being set for a showdown between Ibadan and IJ. By and by, the Alafin came to reckon that Kurunmi was a greater threat to his interests than Ibadan was, and tried some cooling of tempers towards Ibadan. As a result Ibadan tended to be intermittently well disposed towards the Alafin. On one such occasion of good feeling towards the Alafin, for instance, Ibadan chiefs, in 1855, invited the leaders of some Oyo towns and urged voluntary acceptance of allegiance to the Alafin as well as peaceful relations with the Bayokuda and the Ijebu kingdom. The explosion finally came in 1860 when the Alafin Atiba died and he was succeeded by his Arimo, Adelu. In his last days, Atiba had persuaded the Oyo chiefs to set aside the well-known traditional rule and to crown the Arimo after him. Atiba had also broached the matter to the Ibadan rulers and obtained their concurrence, but he had left Kurunmi, the Kakonfo, in the dark. Therefore, when Adelu was crowned Alafin, Kurunmi flatly demanded that Adelu should die, as tradition demanded and that another prince be crowned the Alafin. He then greatly escalated hostile actions against the new Alafin in the upper Ogun area. War flared between Ibadan and Ij. Known to history as the Ij War, this war quickly developed into a siege of Ij by Ibadan. Abe Okuta declared support for Ij and sent an army to its defense. For five years the fighting raged. Ij was reduced to starvation but its defenders, commanded by Kurunmi, known to be the greatest general in the land, held their city. When it looked as if Ij might crumble, Kurunmi's valiant sons threw themselves into a series of vicious attempts to break the siege and all died in the bloody clashes. Then, in 1865, Kurunmi himself, advanced in age and broken-hearted, died and the defenses of Ij collapsed. Ogunmila, then the Balagun of Ibadan, led the final charge into the doomed city, and personally saw to the total destruction of every bit of it, compound by compound. Ij's people scattered in all directions, a large portion fleeing to Abe Okuda while others fled to Oyo and the towns of the upper Ogun and even to Ibadan. In later years, as wild vegetation established itself over the once proud city of Ij, people coined the sad saying, Owoopa Ij la Otibera Ogun Ogunmila, only from palm trees growing in Ij at the time will the world ever be able to ask questions about Ogunmila's assault on Ij. With the elimination of Ij, Ibadan at last became the undisputed dominant power in Yoruba land. A Decade of Minor Wars, 1866-76 The decade following the IJ War, that is 186,676, was a period of minor wars in various parts of Yoruba land. Most of these wars were campaigns whereby Ibadan consolidated its control over most of Yoruba land. These campaigns produced the man regarded by many as the greatest warrior chief and political leader of Ibadan in the 19th century Momo Obado Latusa, alias Asubiro. Latusa had come to Ibadan as a young man from his village of Ilora, where he had been a farmer. Entering into service in Ogunmula's following, he gradually distinguished himself. By the time of the IJ War, he had become one of the foremost men in Ogunmula's command. He rose rapidly thereafter and in 1871 was appointed the highest war chief of Ibadan, the Arona Kakanfo. A man of dazzling talents, considerable charisma, great political ambition and military brilliance, Latusa came to rule over the Ibadan system with a completeness unknown before his time. Conceding only a few towns to the Alafin, Ibadan established control over the upper Ogun region. This was done almost without any fighting, since Ibadan's dominance was so total that most towns in the area happily accepted its protection. In the eastern provinces of the Ibadan Empire, in Ijesa, Ahidi, and Igbamana, some towns had revolted against its overlordship while it had been preoccupied with the Ij War. As soon as the Ij War ended, Ibadan returned to clear up such pockets of revolt. The most important of such campaigns was the attack on Ilesa in 1868, 
resulting in a siege in which Ilesa was very stubbornly defended for months. This confrontation brought into the limelight a Nigesa warrior named Ogdemjib who was the foremost hero in its defense. As a youth, Ogdemjib had lived in Ibadan and served under one of the Ibadan chiefs, and had then returned home to organize for himself a similar following. At last, when it became obvious that the defense of Ilesa could no longer hold, the Ibadan army allowed Ogdemjib to leave the city with his followers, known as the Ipai. Ilesa was then resubdued. Ogdemjib went to live at Atagbolu in the Akure Kingdom and, two years later, he had the satisfaction of joining with a southern Ekiti coalition, based in Igbo Alawan near Atagbolu, to frustrate an Ibadan campaign against part of the Akure Kingdom. In the heart of western Ekiti, Ibadan moved against the Kingdom of Ara. The Ara people, warlike and proud, stoutly defended their city, and many months of siege followed. When Ibadan finally broke through Ara's defenses, many of the prominent citizens of the town, rather than surrender, killed themselves and their families. In these years also, Ibadan took steps to subdue a few kingdoms that had not been subdued before, the most notable of which were the Adu and Iad kingdoms in Ekiti. An army commanded by Alatusa, by then the Aronaka Confo of Ibadan, suddenly veered off its course in the dry season of early 1873, probably in the month of March, and entered into the Adu kingdom. After overrunning the villages of Igeda and Uying, the Ibadan army drew up against the city of Adu itself. Adu had had no reason to expect an Ibadan invasion, and its hurriedly mobilized defenses collapsed quickly. Large numbers of Adu people fled eastwards into the towns of the Gbunyan district or southwards to Eyes. When Latusa's commanders entered the U.S. palace on the second morning, the tall regal person of Adwojiboye, fully dressed in royal splendor, came out to them, and asked them to take him directly to Latusa himself. When they answered that Latusa had gone on to Ifaki some 13 miles away, he insisted that they should take him to Latusa there. Surprised to see the king, Latusa received him with all the honors due to a king, rebuked the officers who had dared to bring him so far out of his palace, and sent him back with messengers carrying loads of gifts for him. Meanwhile, the news that the Yui had left his palace with Ibadan officers had caused a wild stampede in the general population of Adu, with almost all the people fleeing to Gbunyan and to Eyes. When the Yui returned home, therefore, it was to a virtually empty town. As for the Ibadan officers on the spot, apparently confused by Latusa's treatment of the Yui, they took no step to set up even a rudiment of Ibadan overlordship no Agel and no standing unit of troops. About two or three months later, in the spirit of the old hostility between Adu and Ikir, a small army came from Ikir and attempted to destroy what was left of Adu. It was the rainy season, and the flooded Ajilo stream gave the invaders much trouble. Still, as the main body struggled with fording the stream, an advance guard reached the southern wall of Adu at the Jigbo Gate, where they assembled their large arsenal of guns and gunpowder under the command of a man named Leiliton, an Ibadan trader and adventurer and Ikira resident. Adu traditions represent Leiliton as the leader of the invasion, but he was probably no more than the commander of the guards protecting its arms and ammunition. While this advance group waited for the main body coming up through the flooded stream, the remnants of people who had returned to Adu surprised and scattered them there, and captured their cache of arms and ammunition as well as their commander, Alayal Eaton. The main body of invaders disintegrated and scattered, many perishing in the flood in the nearby swamps. After that, running hostilities persisted in the farmlands between Adu and Ikira for over two decades, during which time a small force under a young man named Faparusi established itself on a hill between Adu and Ikira and defended Ido farms. A further sequel to the Ibadan conquest of Adu was that the city of Ais was accused of seizing some of the Adu people who had fled there and selling some of them into slavery. Partly because of that, a coalition comprising two Adu war chiefs, Ajiliju and Falao, the Ijesa chief, Ogdemjib, and some other Akiti chiefs, laid siege to Eyes in 1874 until Eyes fell in 1875. In 1875, too, Ibadan finally moved to put an end to the independence of Asug Baibi's kingdom of Ayat in northern Akiti. The Ibadan army, led by Latusa himself, expected Asug Baibi to be difficult to crack. But what awaited them in northern Akiti still surprised them. Under Isug Baibi's talented leadership, a fairly large coalition of some northern and central Akiti forces waited for Latusa at Ijesa I and Irisan. Latusa had to take the field himself, and his Ibadan hordes scattered Isug Baibi and his allies from Ijesa Aya. Isug Baibi retreated to Aid, and ordered his subjects to evacuate Aid and flee into hiding. He himself then fled with his soldiers to the thickly wooded hills of Omu and Ijalu. Latusa followed him there and sent huge numbers of Ibadan soldiers to storm up the thorny wooded fastnesses of the Omu and Ijalu hills. Isugbaibi surrendered, 
and accepted for aid the status of a tributary to Ibadan. A division of the victorious Ibadan army, engaged in some small actions on its way back home through western Ekiti, was afflicted by a mysterious sickness which killed very many of the men. The Ibadan authorities believed that it was caused by poisons put in food and water by farmers in those parts. The event became known in Ibadan as Ogun Wokudi, the war in which dead bodies were piled up on roadsides. All these events in Ekiti amounted, however, to no more than scattered spots of war. By and large, the Ekiti, Ijesa and Igbamana provinces of the Ibadan Empire remained peaceful in these years, while Ibadan's control grew firmer and more detailed. In Akoko, Ibadan's provincial administration had always been rudimentary and patchy, Akoko being seen at Ibadan as a sort of distant frontier province. Not much improvement seems to have been effected in Ibadan's administration in this province in the years after the IJ war. During these years, one phenomenon which had started to show up as early as the, the first years of the 1860s in the Ijesa, Akiti, Akoko and Igbamana provinces of the Ibadan Empire became very marked. Some of the most ambitious and capable of the provincial men who had gone to Ibadan and participated in the Ibadan system, returned, after some years, to their homes, and established personal followings and imitation of the Ibadan chiefs. A few ambitious men who had never left home, also followed suit. There were very many of these new leaders, but the best remembered are Ogdemjib, Erimoro and Ogun Madini Lesa, Ajaliju and Falao and Adu, Ekiti, Fahambala and Igasi, in the Oi Kingdom, Ajuanag Bagi, Akoko, Bakari and Ifa, Akoko, Fabunmi and Okamesi, Idiel and Ila, Igbam and A, Apampalaso and Omuo, Fabaro and Ito, Akata and Ijero, Agata and Efan, Aliaburod and Akogosi, Apati and Ipitu Ijesha, Arunotan, Samo and Akuri, Akiti and Prince Adaran and Ife. Almost all of these people built up large followings by attracting to themselves their young relatives and other youths. Some, like Fab and me, transformed their age great associations into militant groups. Most augmented their followings by marrying many wives and raising large families and by buying healthy young war captives. Almost invariably, men who entered these groups as captives or slaves grew to become well established persons and raised families of their own within the group. Many of the leaders turned their large groups to farming and became rich thereby. Some, like Fahambala who lived in Igasi, a major trading center in the Oi Kingdom in Akiti, used their groups to venture strongly into trade and became very rich. Almost all gave some military training to men in their followings and built up an arsenal of guns and gunpowder, and some actually used them all in some military activity. In particular, those of Akiti and Akoko were usually drawn into fighting the Nup in the Akoko country as well as in the countries of the Yagba and others in the far northeast. For instance, Ajaliju established his base at Amisi Lazajidi in the district of the Adu kingdom closest to Okoko, and from there went to fight the Nup in Okoko and the country to the north. Some who were descendants of chiefly lineages were honored with their forebears' chieftaincy titles in the traditional political system of their home kingdoms. Of the latter, the most notable was the prince who, after returning to Otun and acquiring much influence, was later crowned the Or of Otun, choosing the cognomen Okanbaloi. Wherever these men lived, they stood out in society and were highly respected and influential. In general they were known as Aligan, war chief. Soon, many young men who had not been to Ibadan at all began to adopt these people's ways each establishing a following, building a new compound, separate from the compound in which they had grown up, and becoming rich, powerful and influential. Of such men, one was Asug Baibi, later the founder of Aid, another was also Ogandana and Akol, in the last decades of the 19th century. A number of young men emerged in the Adu kingdom as Alagun the most notable among them being Oso Akaril, Agbemu, and Faparusi, who became a hero for his prolonged defense of Adu farms in the direction of Akir. In short, then, the political and social system which had evolved in Ibadan became the base from which a new type of elite class arose in the eastern regions of Yoruba land. In the other regions of the country, the war between Ife and Dondo continued in the Ondo kingdom, resulting in the destruction of some Ondo villages. This war was to be the cause of the first British intervention in the politics of the Yoruba interior. From 1869, the British administration of Lagos, which had become a British colony in 1861, sent a number of missions to the Ondo country, to explore ways of restoring peace there. The British objective was to open a new trade route from Lagos to the Yoruba interior through the Ilhe, Ikale and Ondo countries, a route that would be free from the political troubles that plagued the routes through the Ijebu and Igba countries. In 1872, a senior official of the British administration of Lagos, Roger Goldsworthy, persuaded Ondo and Ife to put an end to hostilities. The Ondo people resettled Odondo, 
although Ife would not yet agree to give up Okigbo. With the restoration of peace, Lagos traders streamed to take advantage of the new route through Ondo. From about 1870, Ibadan at last began, from northern Ekiti, to enter into the countries of the Oka and Yoruba the Yagba, O, Jamu, Banu, Ikiri and Oworo in the farthest northeastern corner of Yoruba land, an area which the Ibadan people referred to as Ila Iagba that is, the land of the Yagba. The foreign enemies here were the Noop, but the Ibadan authorities never clearly figured out what to do about them. In principle, Ibadan wanted the Noop out of the whole area and desired control over all its towns and villages. But Masaba, ruler of the new Pemirate of Bita, was engaged in very adroit diplomacy in many directions and appeared sincerely desirous of friendship with Ibadan. Among Ibadan leaders, therefore, the mood was that this ruler could become an Ibadan ally against the Aloran or that, at least, he should not be provoked into becoming an Aloran ally against Ibadan. All this tended to create confusion for Ibadan's men in the field, so that while some Ibadan forces fought the Noop in some places, others ignored Noop activities in other places and still others collaborated with Noop forces in yet other places. Back home in Ibadan, meanwhile, the whole area was usually counted as part of the Ibadan Empire, even though the type of massive effort that could have cleared the Noop out was never given consideration. One Ibadan chief did propose such an effort. Chief Ayrint, as would be remembered, had lived in exile in Owo and had helped Ibadan's war efforts from there. In the late 1860s, he moved to Iron and Okoko and began operations against the Noop and Ila Iagba seizing some villages from them. He then, in the 1870s, asked Ibadan for reinforcements to enable him push the Noop out. However, not only did his plan run foul of the prevailing mood among the Ibadan leaders, he himself was not trusted in Ibadan as rumors were circulating that he intended to create an independent state for himself in the northeast. In the event, many of the war chiefs of Ekiti and Okoko developed ambitions, and became active, in Ila Iagba as well as even in Okoko. Between Ajaliju and the younger warrior, Ogdemjib, who had been acquaintances in Ibadan, a close friendship developed in these years. Still unable or unwilling to return home to Ilesa, Ogdemjib lived in the Ekiti and Okoko area and was a frequent visitor to Ajaliju's camp at Amisi Lazajidi. The two of them, and Falao, ultimately formed an alliance, with the very ambitious objective of driving the Noop out of all northeastern Yoruba land, that is Okoko and Ila Iagba, or Okan Yoruba, territories and replacing Ibadan's control with their own. Taking advantage of gaps and soft spots in Ibadan's establishment, Ajaliju and Falao subdued a few Okoko villages before striking boldly northwards into Ila Iagba. Their most celebrated success against the Noop occurred at Agafar to the north. On their return to Okoko, they joined with Ogdemjib to start a siege against the important market town of Idaani in the Owo Kingdom. Apparently, their purpose was to establish this town as the center from which they would carve out a new state comprising parts of Okoko, parts of Okoko Edo, most of the Okan Yoruba territories, and possibly parts of the Owo Kingdom. Unassisted by Owo, Idaani held on stoutly for more than a year, and finally fell in late 1876. Not long after that, some Allied troops set out from Idaani for an attack on the city of Owo itself. Their venture turned out to be ill fated. Outside Owo, they fell into a well-laid ambush and perished almost to a man, and Ogdemjib and the other leaders of the alliance hurried to deny knowledge of the venture. From Ida'aani, the Allies then entered into Okoko Edo and the neighboring provinces of the Benin Kingdom. Subduing village after village and encountering no real resistance, they moved closer and closer to the city of Benin. According to Okoko, Okoko Edo, Ida'aani and Ekiti traditions, they ultimately began to think of continuing all the way to Benin and subduing that famous city itself. However, talk of attacking Benin increasingly generated nervousness among their men. Finally at a village called Eroikpan, Ogdemjib singer, a man named Anaku, a citizen of Izen Akiti, voiced the men's misgivings in a song, and urged the leaders to let the men forage for booty and turn back. At first angry with Anaku, the leaders later thought the matter over and decided to return to Ida'aani. Back in Akoko, Ajiliju took some more villages and then retired to Amisi Lazajidi to commence large-scale preparations for a siege of Ifa, one of the strongest towns in Okoko. Soon after, messages began to circulate in Ekiti, urging the Ekiti people to rise and unite to drive out the men of Ibadan. A very major phase in the 19th century wars was about to start. Anti-Ibadan Wars of Resistance That major phase of the wars opened with a big bang in Ibadan on Monday, July 30, 1877. On that day, after massive and careful preparations, Ibadan declared war on Abe Okuda. Next morning, an army larger than Ibadan had ever sent out on any campaign, 
bristling with confidence and wildly cheered by large crowds of Ibadan people, marched out towards a Biokuta. It was led by Momo Latusa, the Arona Kakonfo, by then the most dreaded war commander in all of Yorubaland. According to Ibadan's plans, this was to be a short sharp war to destroy or subdue Abiyokuta and thus eliminate Abiyokuta's control of the trade routes to Igbado and the ports of Porto Novo and Lagos. Following the IJ war, all states still independent in Yoruba land had increasingly stood in fear of Ibadan. It seemed only a matter of time before Ibadan would conquer Abiyokuta and even Ijebuot and Deloran, and the small kingdoms of the Igbado country. The Alafans' pretensions about being the king over Ibadan had become completely meaningless, indeed. The Ibadan chiefs increasingly treated the Alafan as a vassal, demanding of him gifts and services that only a vassal would give to an overlord. The Alafan dared not oppose Ibadan openly, and so he became a secret enemy, surreptitiously giving encouragement to Ibadan's enemies. A Bayokuta tightened control on the trade routes through its territory, and Ijebuod, after some hesitation, followed suit all in order to curtail Ibadan's access to guns and gunpowder from the coast. Ibadan's efforts to persuade a Bayokuta, especially, achieved nothing. Therefore, the Ibadan chiefs, after satisfying themselves that the Ijesa, Ife, Akiti, Akoko and Igbamana provinces were peaceful and under good control, decided to change the Igba situation by force. Hence the declaration of war in July 1877. Latusa was confident that success would come very quickly. This, he thought, was the war that would end all wars. Immediately, things began to go against Ibadan's expectations. Rather than end quickly, the campaign against Abeokuta met strong resistance and dragged on until days became weeks and weeks became months. Ibadan took steps to make friends with Ijebu in order to isolate Abeokuta and ensure that the routes through Ijebu would be kept open. Again, after a short vacillation, caused by the opposition of the Ijebu traders to any closing of the routes, the Ijebu government took its decision. The Awujale Adami Uofidipot accused Ibadan of aspiring to become master of the whole world that is, the Yoruba world, and ordered more stringent closure of Ijebu routes against Ibadan traders. Ibadan sent an army to force the Ijebu routes open, the Ijebu army met it at the Ijebu border town of Oru, and a second front to the war emerged. Meanwhile, the people of the Akiti, Ijesa, Igbamana and Akoko provinces of the Ibadan Empire had watched all these developments with interest. In 1878 the Akiti revolted. The trouble started in the small kingdom of Okamesi, then known as Emisi Igbudo. Reacting to the Ibadan Ayali's assault of a woman who was Prince Fabun Miss wife or the wife of his close relative, Prince Fabian Mi attacked the Ayali's residence, killed the Ajel and some of his officials and hangers-on, and burnt down the house. Knowing that Ibadan would respond with a punitive mission, Fabian Mi dispatched urgent messages to all parts of Ekiti, urging the kings and war chiefs to rise and destroy the agents of Ibadan's rule in their towns and villages. The response was immediate almost everywhere. Ibadan Ayalis were set upon and killed or forced to flee. In a few terrible days, the network of Ibadan's provincial administration in Akiti vanished. Leaders all over Akiti knew, however, that Ibadan commanded the means of returning with devastating vengeance. Consequently, they moved the revolt to a higher level. The war chiefs mobilized their men and headed for Fabon Misokamesi, in the border hills of northwestern Akiti, and many of the kings sent high powered envoys. Days of serious meetings followed. Before the meetings ended, the decision was taken to form a confederacy known as Ikiti Parapo. Fabian Mi was appointed commander-in-chief of the Ikiti Parapo armed forces, and teams of men were sent to all parts of Ikiti to appeal for more men, and for contributions of food, guns and gunpowder. Other teams were sent beyond Ikiti to war chiefs, rulers and prominent persons in Ijesa, Igbamana, and Akoko. From all these places, troops, food and war materials flowed to Okamesi. When the two most famous war chiefs in these provinces Ajiliju and Ogdemjib did not show up, strong messages were sent to them, to Ajiliju at Amisi Lazajidi, and to Ogdemjib at Idaani. Meanwhile, the decision was taken not to wait for Ibadan to attack, but to take to the offensive, with the objective of marching through Asin to Ibadan and taking the city. Envoys were sent to Aloran to seek its support and the Emir, after hesitating for some time out of fear of Ibadan, promised to send an army to join up with the Ikiti Parapo forces. When they were finally satisfied that their forces were reasonably ready, the Ikiti Parapo leadership ordered their men to march down the road through the old kingdom of Amisi Ila, to Igbajo. At Igbajo, an Ijesa border town strongly defended by an Ibadan garrison, they met their first resistance. They overcame the opposition and took Igbajo. Then they rolled down the hills to the plains of the Asin Valley and headed for Ikiran, the largest town in this part of the valley. 
Here, they faced their first big trial. Even with the help of the Aloran contingents, they did not have enough forces to surround the big town fully, so they held the eastern and northern parts of the Ikiran walls, apparently hoping that they would have enough time to move up the troops being formed behind them and completely surround Ikiran. In Ibadan meanwhile, the authorities decided to take firm steps to meet the Ikiti Parapo challenge, and a large army was sent out under the command of the Balagana Jayi Jagade, better known by his nickname Ogboriathon. Ogboriathon easily entered Ikiran from the southwest and early the next morning, he took the field against the Ikiti Parapo Confederacy and their Aloran allies. The Ikiti Parapo and Aloran forces seemed to have had some difficulty with coordinating, which gave Ogboriathon a good chance to scatter and decimate them in one single day. Of the many prominent men lost in the day, the most painful to the Confederacy was Prince Adiel Avila. The Aloran troops and many others fled directly north. When they came to the small Odin River a short distance to the north of Akiran, it was unexpectedly flooded. Hotly pressed from behind, many plunged into the flood and drowned so much so that the bodies of men and horses formed a bridge for later arrivals to run or gallop over. From this, the battle earned the name Ogun Jalumi, the war in which men plunged into a flooded river and perished. Most of the Akiti, Ijesa and Igbamana forces fled northeastwards in the direction of Ikan and Otun. Ogboriathon followed them in hot pursuit. In town after town they rallied and tried to fight back, but Ogboriathon's forces were just too strong and too fast for them. It looked as if nothing could save the rebellious provinces from the might of Ibadan. However, as the victorious Ibadan forces stood outside Ikan, ready for the assault, urgent messages arrived from Latusa in Ibadan, ordering Ogboriathon to return home. Ogboriathon and his men gave up the pursuit and started off for Ibadan. Latusa's orders saved the Ikiti Parapo. Apparently, he did not think much of their capabilities, and attached much more importance to the war against Abiyokuda and Ijebu. He was soon to be proved wrong. In the days and months that followed, the Ikiti Parapo, operating mostly out of Otan in northern Ikiti, picked together the shattered pieces of their organization and military machine, mobilized more support, and got ready to move again. They tried everything, but failed, to persuade Ajilaju to come and lead them, they even sent some troops to the aid of Ifa, which Ajilaju had besieged, in order to frustrate him there, in the hope that the old warrior would then come to fight for them. But even after Ifa fell, Ajilaju did not leave Amisi Lazajiti. He considered himself too old for the big venture that the Ikiti Parapo had taken on, even the Ikiti Parapo messengers reported that he was so old that he could no longer see well. Falao wanted to go and sent messengers to tell the Yui so, unfortunately, while preparing to leave, he died as a result of an accident, and his followers, led by two young men named Agbemu and Osoakaril, were too dispirited by the loss of their leader to venture out. As for Ogdemjib, he finally decided to go after much hesitation, and after seemingly endless questions about the true level of resolve among the Ikiti Parapo leaders. When Ogdemjib finally arrived, the much younger and much less experienced warrior, Fabunmi, gladly surrendered to him the position of commander-in-chief. Early in 1879, the Ikiti Parapo forces finally marched again, down the same road as they had done in the previous year. After easily overrunning Igbajo, they again advanced on Ikiran. Outside the walls of Ikiran, a large Ibadan army, led by the Siriki from Ibadan, confronted them. A number of minor engagements followed. Then, rather than wait for a major engagement, the Ikiti Parapo forces retreated in perfect order back up the hills and past the ruins of Igbajo. In the farmland between Igbajo and Emisiila, they stopped, chose a defensible position, and dug in to await the Ibadan army. When the Ibadan army came, it was much larger than the Ikiti Parapo army, and it was by then led by no less a commander than Latusa himself. After the Ibadan army threw itself against the Ikiti Parapo position a few times without much effect. It became obvious that the two armies would be there for some time, facing each other. It turned out to be a long time, punctuated almost daily by fierce battles. By 1880, the two camps had developed features of regular towns each with a large marketplace, workshops, mostly blacksmiths' workshops, and extensive farms in the surrounding farmlands. Soon after the war started, important help was offered the Ikiti Parapo from an outside source. Since early in the 19th century, a community of persons returning from slavery in the Americas and re-captives, people freed from captured slave ships, whom the British had resettled in Sierra Leone, all known as emigrants, had been settling in Lagos. After the Ikiti Parapo was formed in the interior, the Ikiti and Ijesa among the emigrants in Lagos formed themselves into an Ikiti Parapo Association, Lagos. 
the traders among them used their commercial connections to procure for the Ikiti Parapo army some new types of firearms which were then unknown to West Africa breech-loading guns like Snyder rifles, Martini Henry rifles, and Winchester repeaters, all new developments in firearms technology in Europe. The possession of these new guns gave the Ikiti Parapo some superiority in the daily battles for some months, and created considerable distress in the Ibadan camp. But neither side was able to dislodge the other, and the standoff continued. After some time, too, the Ibadan army got some supply of the new guns. The Ikiti Parapo won the diplomatic battles almost overwhelmingly, since all other significant centers of power in Yoruba land were afraid of Ibadan and desired that Ibadan should be humbled. Diplomatic agents of Ibadan and the Ikiti Parapo traversed the country tirelessly, and came across each other in many places. Aloran reaffirmed its alliance with the Ikiti Parapo, and it was strengthened with an exchange of some troops between the Allies. Aloran also stationed a large army just north of Offa, to wait for an opportunity to intervene actively. Throughout the war, the Ikiti Parapo leaders occasionally had reason to doubt the sincerity and intentions of their Aloran allies, but the alliance did hold together till the end. In Ijebu, the Awujale Adama Uofidipot unswervingly rejected all overtures from Ibadan, against the insistent opinions of the leading Ijebu traders, and made it clear that he supported the struggle of the Ikiti Parapo. In 1882, Ife revolted against Ibadan and declared support for the Ikiti Parapo. In response, Ibadan sent a small army to join with Modak to sack Ila Ife, forcing the people of Ila Ife to withdraw to a village called Isoya. The Ikiti Parapo sent an army under Fabian Mi assisted by Aramoro, an Ijesa chief, and the Awujale sent an army under the Sirikio Gunzagun, to the aid of Ife, and a new war front emerged on Ife soil. The Ilafin established secret contacts with the Ikiti Parapo and frequently sent them messages of encouragement. Openly, however, he had to appear to support Ibadan but the Ibadan leaders had good reason to believe that he secretly supported the Ikiti Parapo, and frequently threatened him on that account. Abi Okuda remained at war with Ibadan. Ikiti Parapo agents made strenuous efforts to persuade the Osemo of Ondo to bar Ibadan traders and supporters from the newly opened routes through the Ondo country. But Ibadan's agents were very busy in the palace of the Osemo too. The outcome was that the Osemo, while making it clear that he endorsed the aspirations of the Ikiti Parapo, chose not to take sides but to allow all parties free use of the routes through his kingdom. However, Ife territory lay north of Ondo and the Ondo routes therefore passed through Ife territory, and with the revolt of Ife against Ibadan in 1882, Ibadan experienced increasing difficulties on these routes. In the far southeast, Ikiti Parapo agents also worked hard to persuade the Olowo of Owo to deny Ibadan traders the use of the routes through Owo to Benin. Just as in Ondo, Ibadan agents worked hard in Owo too. In the end, the Olowo adopted the same posture as the Osemo. But Ibadan had serious troubles on the routes through Owo since the northern reaches of those routes all passed through territories of the Ikiti Parapo. In late 1882, a slight break occurred in the nearly solid front against Ibadan. The strong class of Ijebu traders, who had always complained that the blockade of the Ijebu routes hurt their trade, at last won the support of Chief Onafalcon, the Balagun of Ijebu forces. Faced by a revolt of influential citizens championed by the Balagun, the Awujale Fidipot fled into exile. The Balagun then opened the routes, thus allowing Ibadan traders to pass through. However, even he was so distrustful of Ibadan that he kept the army intact and ready at Oru. The ultimate benefits to Ibadan of the Ijebu situation turned out to be very little. Abi Okuda immediately started raids into Ijebu in order to disrupt the routes there, while the Siriki Ogunzagun and his army near Ife continued to uphold the policies of the exiled Awujale. The sum total of the results of the diplomatic contests, then, was that while the Ikiti Parapo won allies, supporters and sympathizers, Ibadan won virtually none. In effect, indeed, the Ikiti Parapo became the frontline prosecutors of a broadly based national war against the awesome dominance of Ibadan. That national war saddled Ibadan with the standoff with the Ikiti Parapo, with other engagements with Abe Okuda on the Abe Okuda farms, with Ijebu at Oru, with Iloran at Afa, with Ikiti Parapo, Ife and Ijebu in Ife. From the 1880s, the Fon Kingdom of Dahomey added to Ibadan's burdens. Dahomey had launched major attacks on Abe Okuda in 1851 and again in 1864, and had been repulsed on both occasions. Dahomey had also been fighting with Abe Okuda over the Igbato towns. Now taking advantage of Ibadan's preoccupation with wars on many fronts, Dahomey began harassing the upper Ogun region of the Ibadan Empire, the towns of Agana, Okhu and others, 
and continued to do so until the 1890s. As far as the war between Ibadan and the Ikiti Parapo was concerned, Ibadan's multiple commitments and problems made it possible for the Ikiti Parapo to stand in the field, head to head with the mighty Ibadan, indefinitely. As would already be obvious from all the above, the standoff between Ibadan and the Ikiti Parapo in the farmlands between Emisi Il and Igbajo occupied center stage in the political life of Yoruba land throughout the last two decades of the 19th century. Generally known as the Kerji War, a name derived from the noise of guns in the daily battles, especially the noise of the ricochet from the new high-velocity rifles, it caught and held the attention of all Yoruba people. By 1885, both sides in the Kerji War had started to show signs of war weariness. Then in that year, Latusa died in the Ibadan camp, and the affairs of the Ibadan war effort fell into the hands of much lesser men than he. The situation was ripe for a cessation of war. Consequently, persons representing the British government of Lagos, assisted by CMS emigrant pastors, came to the Kirji war front in 1886 and succeeded in persuading the Ibadan and Dikiti Parapo leaders to agree to terms of peace resulting in the 1886 Treaty of Peace signed by the Ibadan chiefs and the war chiefs and some of the kings of the Ikiti Parapo. The same commissioners went to Ife and worked out a treaty of peace there. Neither of these treaties, however, brought the war situation to an end. Though Ibadan and the Ikiti Parapo adhered to the terms of the treaty and abstained from further fighting, neither side trusted the other well enough to be willing to be the first to start breaking up camp. As a result, the two sides sat there facing each other for seven more years. As for the treaty in Ife, its most important provision namely, that the people of Modak should disband their town and relocate westwards near to Ibadan proved unacceptable to the majority of Modak people. Therefore, the situation around Ife remained unchanged, Modak kept its place, Ila Ife people continued staying at Isoya, and the Ibadan, Ikiti Parapo and Ijebu armies stayed put, though no further fighting occurred. In the far north, in the area immediately south of Aloran, some change in the lineup took place in 1887. Apparently wrongly believing that the era of wars had ended, the people of Afa let a dispute over the succession to the throne of the Alifa get out of hand. The commotion between the contending parties became so bad that the Ibadan defenders of Afa, rather than let themselves be drawn into it, left the town in disgust and withdrew south to Ikaran. One of the Afa parties then jubilantly invited the Aloran army, that had long camped a short distance to the north, into Afa. The Aloran army entered and its leading commander, Karara, the Balagun Gambari, ordered that all the chiefs and prominent citizens of both Afa parties be assembled and slaughtered. Karara's army then viciously looted and took possession of Afa. Thereafter, Aloran resumed hostile thrusts towards the south end of the country between Afa and Ikiran. However, the Ibadan army at Ikiran continued to be a terror to Aloran. In these circumstances, the Aloran activities consisted merely of flash raids, which were quickly abandoned as soon as Ibadan troops appeared. These activities continued until 1893. In the years following the collapse of Afa also, the Aloran chiefs sent some representatives of theirs to some Igbamana towns, and behaved as if such towns were subject to Aloran and this caused much disappointment and anger in the Ikiti Parapo camp. For the Ikiti Parapo leaders, the years 188,693 were years of careful watching of Ibadan's actions, and of considering how to handle Aloran's pretensions. They were there four years of deliberations about the future of the Ikiti Parapo Confederacy. Concerning this, many ideas emerged in their deliberations, but ultimately the most popular was that the populations of Ikiti, Ijesa, Igbamana and Dakoko be relocated into a few large cities comparable to Ibadan. This envisaged the abandonment of all old towns and villages and the moving of their residents to the few large cities, strategically located. The objective was to ensure that the people of the Ikiti Parapo territories would ever in the future be able to preserve their freedom against Ibadan or Aloran or the Noop or any other aggressors. Before this massive program could be embarked upon, however, the Ikiti Parapo camp had to be broken up in 1893, and all its chiefs and people had to return to their homes. The years 18,923 saw the termination of all major wars as European powers along the West African coast embarked on seizing territories in the hinterland. The scramble by European countries for African territorial possessions had begun. In 1892, the British sent a military expedition to conquer the Ijebu country and make its routes open to Lagos, and the French conquered the Fon Kingdom of Dahomey and the Asia country. Early in 1893, some senior officials of the British colony of Lagos came into the interior, made a treaty with Ibadan, got Ibadan to return its armies home, and saw to the disbanding of the Kerji war camps. All thoughts that wars might be resumed in the future 
and all thoughts of the Ikiti Parapo leaders for the future of their confederacy, quickly dissipated as the British and other Europeans established their rule over all of Yorubaland. The Last Wars Only in the far northeastern Yorubaland, in the homeland of the small subgroups, Yagba, Jamu, Banu, Owaro, etc., which Ibadan called Dila Iagba, was the fire of war still burning after 1893. In this corner of Yorubaland, the years of the Kerji War had witnessed a great expansion and intensification of Noop raids, together with some elaboration of Noop control in some places. Noop raids and capture of people for slaves had caused the emergence of many refugee settlements. It had also generated very intense anti noop hostility, not only in these Yoruba towns, villages and settlements, but over a much larger area including neighboring Afanmaya and Ibira countries. As noop traders, troops, and persons representing noop control were routinely attacked and killed everywhere, the position of the noop gradually weakened. The climax to these generalized acts of resistance had occurred in 1885 when, outside the Yagba town of Ife, Local farmers had ambushed and brutally killed an important new prince Adu Bita from Bita, and the group of people in his company. In response, Bita had prepared a major invasion and the leading persons all over the Okan Yoruba towns and villages had called for a unified front to resist. In 1894, in a refugee settlement named Agiti, representatives of the various oppressed subgroups and communities met and formed a grand alliance for the purpose of liberating their country from the Nub. This Agiti alliance borrowed its organization, strategies and tactics from ideas of the Ikiti Parapo, and, at its peak, it commanded forces drawn from the Iamu, Iagba, Owaro, O, Ikiri, Banu, and even Akoko and some Ekiti with some support from even the neighboring Ebura. The various northeastern Yoruba communities wiped out all traces of Noop control and claims by killing Noop agents or by forcing them to flee, as young men flooded to join the armed forces of the alliance. The Noop forces, led by their cavalry, confidently expected that they would quickly disperse the forces of the alliance. But, in fact, in the fighting that ensued, the alliance forces, continually enlarged by the arrival of more fighting men, grew steadily stronger than the Noop forces. Fighting in fervently hostile territory, the Noop troops increasingly found their movements restricted and their food supply in jeopardy. Their increasing use of force to seize food from farmers only heightened the hostility and the consequent difficulties. In contrast, the morale of the alliance was boosted by its improving strength and manpower, food supply, and widespread local support, and by encouraging showings against the Noop forces in the frequent engagements. After some months of fighting, the leaders of the alliance became so confident of victory that they even began to consider plans for advancing into the Noop country itself in order to destroy Bita and free their people who were being held as slaves there. While the conflict thus raged, a small constabulary of the British agency that was taking over the lands of the Niger, the Royal Niger Company, appeared in that part of the country. In June 1896, it clashed with elements of the Noop forces and lost many of its men. Thereupon, the Royal Niger Company prepared for major operations against the Noop. Assisted with men, food and intelligence by the Agiti Alliance and by the general population of the anti-Noop communities, Royal Niger Company forces advanced on Bita in January 1897. Surprised, the Noop forces disengaged from their fight against the Agiti Alliance and retreated to their own country, but they failed to save Bita. Bita capitulated on January 31, 1897. Noop pressure on northeastern Yoruba land thus came to an end. The Agiti Alliance was disbanded, and so were most of the refugee settlements of the area. Crowds of enslaved men and women freed themselves and returned home from the Noop country. With that, the last of the wars in Yoruba land in the 19th century came to an end. Effects of the Wars The first visible effect of the Yoruba Wars of the 19th century was the widespread destruction of cities, towns and villages. For some 700 years the Yoruba people had built cities and towns all over their country, in the course of one century they smashed many of the biggest and best of them. The areas most profoundly affected were the territories of the Oyo, Igba and Ou subgroups. The great city of Oyoila, for two centuries the greatest and most prestigious city of the Yoruba people, perished completely. So did many other cities in the Oyo homeland for instance Ikoi, Kuo, Igbagun, Ouipol, the proud city of the Olawas, and the Igba royal towns of Ake, Oko, Kesi, Ito, Alugun, all suffered the same fate, not to count the many small Ou and Igba towns that were obliterated. Ij, the old trading town of the Igba people, revived and flourished for some five decades, and then was wiped out. Even the ancient sacred city of Ila Ife, the place from which the sun rises, did not avoid the 19th century depredations. Torn down twice over, however, it managed to rise again each time. 
for a people who pride themselves as builders of, and dwellers in, large cities and towns, it is surprising how easily the Yoruba people allowed themselves in the 19th century to plunge into the destruction of the proud icons of their history. One resident of Lagos, who had probably visited the interior, especially towns in eastern Yoruba land, lamented, in a letter to a Lagos newspaper, the shattered towns and palaces, with the following lines quoted from a poem. The spider holds the veil in the palace of Caesar, the owl stands sentinel on the watchtower of Afraziab. On June 4, 1851, some weeks after the CMS missionary, David Hinderer, started his Christian mission in Ibadan, he toured the ruins of Ouaipul. And he noted in his diary, This afternoon, I rode out to the place of Old Ou which is only two miles from my lodging. Ou was an old very large town, it was destroyed about 30 years ago and is now converted into farms by the Ibadan people but main ruins still remain, to think of the awful and bloody scenes such a large place must have witnessed at the time of its destruction makes one shudder and feel and William H. Clark, who visited Ila in 1858, wrote the following sad comment on the condition of the Orangun of Ila, whom he described as the monarch of Igbomna. If there is a being that deserves our pity and sympathy, it is the unfortunate one whom the ravages of time have reduced from opulence and power to a state of poverty and penury. Such seemed to be the condition of the monarch of Igbomina. Whatever the country and capital may have been in its palmy days, there are marks sufficiently evident to prove that those days are no more, that the power of royalty is lost and the kingdom exists only in name. The human suffering consequent upon all the devastation and acts of war was grave. The seemingly endless battles and raids resulted in the scattering of countless lineages and families, and in the loss and destitution of many of their members. Persons torn from their roots and homes, and wandering without clear destinations, constituted a large pool of vulnerable targets for adventurers and criminal kidnappers in most parts of the country. Even among groups managing to flee in some order, loss, deprivation and destitution were common experiences. Intense distress bred brigandage, disloyalty and perfidy, manifesting in kidnappings, the sale of friends by friends, and callous reward of hospitality and kindness with vileness and terror. In many parts of the country, refugee settlements sprang up, each the scene of hard struggles by individuals and groups to survive. The traditional norm of respect for peaceful traders on highways survived quite well in most parts, but greatly increased hazards from acts of war and crime increased the frequency and sizes of traders' caravans as a mode of travel. On the whole, for probably most of the century, the incidence of human distress would seem to have been greater in the Oyo and Igbomina provinces in the north, and the broad middle belt stretching from Ife westwards into the Igbado country. From about the 1880s, the extreme northeastern region of Yorubaland, under nuke pressure, witnessed greatly increased distress also, 